Hello, teachers. It is a snowy day in both Springfield, Missouri, and Finley, Ohio, and I'm pretty sure in Canton, too, if that's where you're at. Um, really, a large part of the nation is pretty much under snow today. So we thought, hey, let's let's still be productive as much as we can, and let's uh, let's do this video on the next lesson, lesson number 11, and Daniel, and Brother Ray, this is probably the most well-known story maybe at odds with uh, the three Hebrew children, but pretty close to the most well-known story in all of Daniel. Oh, I, I'm confident that's true. Uh, every child that's ever grown up in Sunday school has heard about Daniel and the lion's den. It, may, it only may be rivaled by David and Goliath as an yes. overall Bible story, huh? Yeah, at some point, it doesn't really matter which one's more popular. They're just pretty cool stories. They really are, and more than that, they teach some amazing principles, and today we're going to look at this story, and Daniel, we're going to focus on an aspect of the story, but boy, there's some rich lessons for us to, to learn or at least be reminded of. They're classic for a reason. I mean, this is a, one of the things I've noticed over the years is when you go to, I think we said this about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a few weeks ago, um, when you our minds automatically go to the flannel graph or the veggie tales or what, whatever our context was growing up um, and how we think of it. It's funny. We brought up flannel graph before and I got a message from, uh, in the BBC classes, I got a message from Jeanette Lang that said, I was in a flannel graph <laughs> class with, with the mini Mitchell. So anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, that is but, funny. Uh, know, the, the thing is Ben, that, uh, in this particular story, as in others, there are just so many significant things to learn. But right. you would be surprised that I meet people from time to time that are even taking some classes and they haven't heard the story of right. Daniel in the lion's den or David and Goliath. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, I, I remember um, when I first became a youth pastor, not to belabor the point, but when I became a youth pastor, I, I took over and, and, and we had a bunch of kids that we were starting to reach. And I would say Jonah and the whale. And they look at me like, well, what are you talking about? You know, because not everybody knows that we live in a post-Christian culture a little bit. And that's, going, that's what's going on. That's why it's valuable to look at this story again. Yeah, let's not skip it. So you, you put this subject and this is probably what you're talking about. We're saying uh, focusing on something, um, this idea of trust. And that at some point, trust uh, can't just be like a theoretical thing. In the life of a Christian, there's a time where trust has to be exercised and exhibited. And that's what you're saying here, that uh, to honor the Lord, we have to exhibit trust. Um, and just tell us what was, and I'm sure we'll do this in the whole conversation, but um, tell us ex exactly why you thought that was the subject for the lesson. Well, uh, you know, ultimately, it's going to come down to a life or death decision for Daniel. Right. And he's going to live by the godly pattern that he had always lived by. He was not going to compromise his character or his ethics. And it, it put him in a situation where he could lose his life. And it was at that moment and all the way through the story that he had to have impeccable trust that God would honor him for his faithfulness. And no matter what happened, he had to trust God. Right. That's exactly right. So your, your objective sentence says, for all believers, trust should be exhibited in every situation to honor God by three reactions modeled by Daniel. So you're seeing, first of all, the trap set that's given us to us in verses 10 through 14. Um, can you give us a little bit of context? We've, we've already had some context in the book of Daniel here. Daniel is in Babylon, yes, and he's a servant of a king. Um, but what we need to point out in this chapter right. is that Daniel, who was taken into Babylonian captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar, the great right. monarch of the Babylonian Empire, right. Daniel has now lived through the entire Babylonian kingdom. He has served under every king of Babylon. Right. Now, the Bible only mentions two by name, and that was Nebuchadnezzar. And then in chapter five, it's the story of Belshazzar. 
where remember the handwriting on the wall right uh, that warned belshazzar he he was going to die but uh now daniel is actually in the persian kingdom uh, the persians have defeated the impregnable city of babylon and now the great medio persian empire have taken over this entire region and uh daniel is now serving in in the administration of the Persian monarch. The Bible refers to him in Daniel chapter 6 as Darius, but the last verse of Daniel 6 also mentions Cyrus. And as we point out, the term Darius in the Persian language and records was really more like a title, the royal one. And so I think it's referring to Darius throughout the chapter kind of with that royal title, but his throne name was the great conqueror of Persia, Cyrus II or Cyrus the Great. This okay. is the same guy who's gonna be so impressed by Daniel after this incident and others that Cyrus is that any of the Jews that wanna leave Babylon and go back and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple they can do that. Okay, wow. So now we're in the Persian Empire. Wow, interesting. It is amazing that uh, Daniel is a friend of so many kings. You know, like they keep being impressed by him. It's pretty cool. Well, and if you had the mind of God like he did, uh, they could not find anything to accuse him That's of. Right. And uh, he was just so valuable to every one of those monarchs, no doubt. Right. And certainly what we saw with Nebuchadnezzar the last couple of weeks and what we see uh, in chapter five with Belshazzar that we haven't capitalized on studying. Right but now we're going to see that God is still going to honor his faithful man, even though Daniel's probably now uh, around 80 or probably over 80 years old. So some guys in the in the kingdom um want daniel to be uh to be uh they're basically targeting him they they want him they want him to be, get in trouble and they want his influence and power to be diminished and so they according, go to according to verse three in chapter six right it says that they had tried to catch him doing something wrong because they were gonna they wanted to report him and get him right. removed from the the highest office and verse three says that, that Daniel, because of such stellar character, that he was preferred above the presidents and princes because of an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And that's when these jealous other administrators decide to make up things. And Ben, do you remember what it was when they couldn't find anything to accuse him of? What was it they finally accused him of? Uh, prayerfulness. <laughs> yes. Essentially. Right? In verse 5, it says, we can't do anything except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Yeah. And they knew that they could trap Daniel. And that's exactly where this is headed as they approach the great king and just make up a story about daniel and his faithfulness and so that that's where we find ourselves in the text that we've selected starting in verse 10 daniel hears this is interesting now when daniel knew that the writing was signed talking about the law right uh he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber towards jerusalem he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his god as he did a four time then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man should ask a petition of any God or any man within 30 days, says of thee, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, Thus that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor to the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. 
Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. All right. There are, there are a number of things we just right. need to pull out of that. Uh, just reading it, though, it's just such an amazing story. And, yeah, you know, Daniel was, uh, he trusted God in that he was not going to compromise once he heard about this decree. But, you know, when you read verse 11, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication. I mean, it's like they're spying on him in order to catch him praying because he did it all the time. Right. And he was not going to alter his pattern, his habit of life to pray three times a day facing Jerusalem and pray to God. And so this is where they said, we are, we're only going to get him if we can catch him doing something concerning his God. So uh, let me just explain a little bit. These guys come with flattering words and manipulation, and they get Darius all proud and happy, and, and they say, you know, you should sign a decree that for 30 days, nobody's allowed to pray to any god, nobody's allowed to make any petition of any god, but only you, O king. And he thought, oh, that's a pretty good idea. They wanted to make him God for a month. And so he, he agreed to this thing. And without considering all of the unintended consequences, he signs this decree. Now, it mentions about the law of the Medes and the Persians. That you know, we even, not. Exactly. But yeah. we even say that sometimes in modern right. time. We'll say, oh, the law of the Medes and the Persians. That means this can't be broken. Right. Well, but... In those days, the Medes and the Persians had come together as two different kingdoms, and that's how they had defeated the great Assyrian Empire in the north. And then with uh, Cyrus taking over, he, his, he was predominantly from the Persian side, and they defeated Babylon. And really, we talk about the Medo-Persian Empire. That's where this idea of the law of the Medes and the Persians but really the Persians will end up being the strongest group. Right. And so oftentimes we just refer to them as the Persian Empire and Cyrus being one of their great monarchs. That's who we're talking about here. And uh, yet he's so flattered. But what was the result if somebody disobeyed this law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not? Lions dead. Yep. There was going to be, an, this was, uh, this was an, a capital offense. Right to seek a petition or pray to another God would result in a death sentence. Right. And the clear implication of the story is Daniel is going to be the first one tested under this law. And that's why when you read verse 10, it, it stuck out that after he knew that the writing had been signed, he still went to his home still opened the doors or the windows facing Jerusalem, knelt down as he did every day, every three day. times a day. And he prayed to God knowing that they were watching and trying to catch him. I think it's something to be said in application that he wasn't, he wasn't suddenly faithful in mm. times of persecution. He was already faithful when there was no persecution. Good. Yeah. And good. that, and I think that's interesting. But then when persecution came, it was like, I'm not, I'm not changing. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And, you know, we, we mentioned this with the story of the three Hebrew children in the right. fire furnace. You know, Daniel knew that this was a 30 day deal. Right. You know, he could have a pragmatic approach to this whole thing. The way a lot of modern Christians would have handled it was, you know, I'm just going to close the windows for a month. Yeah. <laughs> they won't catch me. Or I'll if pray I'm, in my head. <laughs> yes, exactly. They can't stop me from doing that. Right. But the truth of the matter is, those are self-serving changes right. in your pattern. And rather than being selfish and trying to deceive the way he normally lived on this matter, he just continued his pattern. And they caught him. 
what's it i think it's also interesting um and this speaks to what you were saying about the laws of the Medes and persians it's almost like not only did they catch daniel but they kind of caught the king in the oh, sense absolutely. that the king was like oh man what have i done you know exactly. that's kind of what is inflected there well the two verses that you read verse 13 says after they come to daniel so it's the same guys apparently that have assembled to watch daniel and catch right. him now they go to the king and verse 13 says that daniel yeah. you know can't you just hear it yeah it, it, he's made they're making this clear accusation against the hebrew person He's not one of us, but yet you've elevated him to right. such a high position. But that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. And so what does verse 14 says that Darius is furious. He's mad. Who's he mad at? Himself. He is with mad himself. at himself. He realizes they have trapped me here. But my, not to spoil the ending, but they also kind of trap themselves in this moment, right? They do. They do. Yeah. And we'll look at that, I'm sure, coming up. But we will. We will. But uh, uh, yeah. notice that Darius, he worked tirelessly all day trying to figure out, is there some loophole here? Are I let Daniel out? But they is kept this, reminding him, it's the law of the Medes and the Persians, which offer it not. Is this a testament to big government bureaucracy? Is that what? <laughs> I, I knew one of us was going to go there. <laughs> we had to. We have to. Yeah. But I'll anyway. tell you what, Ben, really on a practical level, though, is there going to come a time where we're yeah. going to have to be Damn. people of character? And are we ready to stand? We talked about standing alone like the three Hebrew children did. But, you know, in this story, it, it teaches us that we should not capitulate to ungodly things and change our Christian position because it's expedient. Daniel didn't do that, not even for 30 days. This weekend, I'm teaching on Romans chapter 12 and going into that passage, it says, let love but love be without a so, uh, dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, and cling to that which is good. And when you read the rest of the descriptions of, that's kind of like the heading for the rest of that thing, that chapter, and there's a bunch of evil things and then and good things, you know, to cling to. Anyway, one of the things he says is, uh, don't curse those who persecute you. Mm. You know, basically it's, it's another way of saying, love your enemies. And I think it's interesting um, that, that idea of um, clinging to what is good is that the word cleaving. It, it's, this, uh, the, it's the same word that uh, shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, proskaleo. Anyway, cleaving to what's good, that's exactly what Daniel's doing. Like, no matter what is bad could happen to me, I'm going to cleave to what's right here. I am joined at prayer. I, I am clinging to that even if it means the lions. I think that's amazing. That is. It absolutely is. Well, the second reaction deals with the actual verdict, the fact that I call it the door was shut, which yes. is them carrying out what appears to be the death sentence against Daniel. You and they think it's verses? over. Yeah, verse 15. Then these men assembled under the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him in the den of the lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, the signer of his lords, the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Yeah. So after working all day long to the going down of the sun, Darius could not find a way to let Daniel go. So he brings Daniel in, and I find this to be such an interesting paradox. He, he says, 
I cannot alter the law of the Medes and the Persians, but he says there in verse 16, by God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Now, where do you think Cyrus got that idea? <laughs> he didn't worship the Hebrew God until he met Daniel. And now all of a sudden he has such a great admiration for this unflappable Christian, this unflappable believer in God. And, and, and he says, he almost says it in a complimentary way, whom thou service continually. Yeah. Even in this matter, you didn't stop praying to your God because right. you serve him continually. And if there's any way out of this, your God can deliver you. Brother Ray, why? it's obvious that Darius was upset. I mean, at himself, at himself, and at, but, guys. And at the guys, but also, also obviously concerned for Daniel. Oh, absolutely. I mean, clearly he's no Netflix, no, <laughs> no, uh, no music playing, no entertainment, no sleep. Like he's up all night. Yeah. If, I, I find that really interesting. I like to, I said it in our lesson that I said, they put Daniel in the den of lions. They, they sealed it by putting this heavy stone right. over the entrance. Then they, they put their insignia emblem right. on it to make sure that nobody broke the rule. And then the Holy Spirit moves us over to the palace and we find out all night what Darius is doing. Yeah. Who cares? We want to know what's going on to right. Daniel in the lion's den. <laughs> right. And, and it's just this kind of amazing uh, crescendo to the story, but we're held in suspense all night long. It's great storytelling. <laughs> exactly. It's great storytelling. <laughs> exactly. It's great storytelling. The, uh, I guess the reason why I brought all that up, though, was what is it about the law of the Medes and the Persians that makes it so durable? against the the king who's like i mean that who signed the decree that seems very like not ancient well, um but let me explain what the purpose of it was these were not supposed to be hastily designed laws they were supposed to take a lot of deliberation they were supposed to think about it they were supposed to say what are all of the unintended consequences if we make this a law of our land that seems like a good policy. Like it would be maybe, a good we should, policy. maybe we should we should not pass it so that we know what's in it. That kind of a thing. Right? If, <laughs> I, if they if they had heard that language before, it probably would have been included in this story. Correct. <laughs> but that's that's again part of this insidious plot is they tricked the king. And by the way, we didn't mention it, but in the previous verses they said. They, they all, we have all come to this conclusion that you should be God for a month. Right. Well, that's not true. Daniel was never consulted and he right. was the head of all of them. Right. And so, but that's the guy they're trying to remove. So they, they lie and make these false accusations and trick the king. And, but in pride, he hastily signed this decree. Right. That's not what you were supposed to do with the law of the Medes and the Persians. And then we have the third part here, the third reaction, the tables are turned. What a, what a great way of saying it. Then the king arose very early in the morning. Man, the suspense on this. I, I know the story and I'm like, yeah. what's gonna happen? Uh, and when it it's hasn't changed the middle, since the last time I read it. <laughs> it hasn't changed nothing. <laughs> then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice. That's that's a good detail. Yeah, yeah. I hope this is, I hope he answers. Lamentable voice of Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou service, continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth, and they have not 
hurt me. For as much as before him in innocence, he was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt found upon him was found upon him because he believed in his God. And the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused Daniel and they cast him in the den of the lions, them, their children and their wives. And the lions had mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Yeah, you know, this is after this sleepless night, Darius, and the implication is that he runs over there, you know, he makes haste to get there, but I, I, you emphasized what I emphasized in the lesson, that he got there and he cried with a lamentable voice. Now, I mean, that's kind of a wail, but it also is kind of an expectation that it's not it, nothing's going to happen. You know, he he's lamenting because he really thinks there's no way Daniel survived this, even though he asked the question, oh, Daniel, is your God who you serve continually able to deliver thee? But there's, there's I really, really mean the idea that I don't I don't expect a positive response. here. Well, the, the thing I was going to say is I wonder if I was directing this as a movie. I'm reading between the lines and maybe this is saying something that shouldn't be said, but it would make it really cool if he yells that and he's going to turn around like he knows he's not going to hear an answer. And then all of a sudden, oh, King live forever. And he's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like there's some kind um, of surprise. I wonder yeah. if that's how it was. Maybe you should have been a director instead of a preacher. I, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm that. just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, you're, no, that, you're exactly right. And you wonder if there, there, there's no white space in between the verses. Or right. Whether or not there was a little pause. Right. <laughs> because maybe he did think there's no answer. But and I, I would almost make Daniel be like, oh, King, you know, like, make, surprise him. Like, you're going to love this, you know. And, and yeah. isn't it funny, even the way, the the word of god wrote it that daniel is still being completely respectful when he says oh king live forever that was just a a modern greeting when you right. came to the presence of the king and so uh, he does and then he does he gives full explanation of how this yeah. happened that god sent an angel uh and, and has shut the mouths of the lions but it, yeah. it was more than that first of all let me tell you what I heard at the state university when I went over there and we, they talked about this story. You know what the, the, the critics explained this about on why Daniel survived in the lion's den? Because either the lions had been overfed and they just weren't hungry or perhaps they were sick. And that's how Daniel managed to find a corner apparently somewhere and survive through the night. But that is just not true and we're going to see the rest of the story right here that but, other uh, detail is very inconvenient then right? yeah. yeah yeah it really is that kind of argues against that uh, but yeah. the other part of it is they ended up saying uh you know they they pull him out and they examine him because lions don't only kill you with their mouth you know the i mean one swipe of a paw right would have killed daniel uh so god clearly protected his prophet and honored his faithfulness and daniel had this unequivocal trust uh one other thing i'll point out about that is maybe you like me have seen the children's bible uh, where they have pictures for kids you remember the one of where Daniel's in the lion's den and he's actually using a lion as a pillow as to a sleep pillow. on? Now, I'm on it. I don't know that that happened. I know. <laughs> that may be a little presumptuous, but uh, clearly God did a miraculous thing to rescue his man, our hero. I, I don't know who the artist is. It may not even be someone famous, but there is a picture, and I think you, many of us have not probably seen it, of daniel standing with his back to the lions and his, and his hands behind his 
looking up, you know, and I love that picture. I do too. Like, you know, in, in that picture that you just described, which I've seen and love as well, but that shows a picture of complete serenity and surrender to God, a total issue of trust. He trusts God, even in that circumstance that would seemingly be uh, inescapable. So Darius is excited. <laughs> Daniel, get him out of there quick before they change their minds. Right. But, uh, God delivered him, uh, sent an angel to protect him. And then uh, when they examine him, there's not a single mark on him that he had been injured. And then to combat <laughs> the the silly the silliness of people that try to just undo everything that god tries to do um the people don't even the people that get thrown in um their 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 fate was sealed the trap they basically ended up being being in their own trap and uh, they don't even hit the floor yep that's exactly what it says they're, they're the lions had mastery of them before they ever touched the ground and i'll just point out because it seems like such a harsh judgment right the way the persians and by the way other ancient kingdoms would do when darius had discovered the plot and that he had been duped and lied to about daniel right and then he sleeps he's sleepless all night long he's thinking about this you know his anger is getting more and more oh, yeah. right. against these false accusers and so when it comes time, typical to what the Persians would do, they would destroy the, the guilty party, his wife and children, and basically expunge any record that they ever lived. Oh, wow. The Persian records. He, this, there was not going to be any person that would ever secede this, this false leader and they would expunge his name from the record to make sure that. And so that's the reason why even the families were destroyed in what appears to be a, a, a very harsh judgment against them. And that's why we know the name of Daniel and, and uh, Darius Cyrus. Yeah. And we don't know who, we don't know the names of those guys. Yeah. And, and I, we did not take time in the lesson but everybody should read verses 25 to 28 in the book, because once again, just like with Nebuchadnezzar before in chapter four, now here Cyrus eulogizes the great God of Daniel, who's able to save from the lions. And there better not be anybody in the Persian empire that say anything bad about the God of Daniel. It's an amazing one, thing. One of the things that strikes me, and, and I hope, man, I hope I never have to apply this, but <clears throat> we'll see. But it's amazing to me <clears throat> the, um, how God has used persecution, um, the persecution of his people. I mean, even one of the, I think one of the strongest arguments for the, for the validity of the resurrection is mm -hmm. the fact that the guys who... Peter says we can't help but speak the things we've seen and heard not just the good teaching that we got from Jesus but we saw him dead and now alive and and then they literally dying died for that and even like we've seen that theme in the book of Daniel someone furious um a hater of God wanting to be worshiped and then and then completely turning on a dime and extolling the name of God yeah um and so God, so I guess what I would say is that um, this idea of daring to be a Daniel or daring to stand alone, you know, as the song goes, um, is bigger than us. It's bigger than just, it's bigger than just um, um, us being faithful to God. It, it is, it's evangelistic. It's, it's, it says something about who God is and, and, and that kind of a thing. And so we got to be prepared for that in times when there's not as much persecution because we could face that kind of persecution. And what, what are our lives going to say about God? And ultimately it all boils down to how big is our God? That's it. And will we trust him 
right? even with our life. That's exactly right. So this is Brother a good Ray, one. Thanks for the thanks for helping us think through that. And uh, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Father, thank you for your many blessings. You know, thank you for uh, Trinity Baptist Church. Thank you for Canton Baptist. Thank you for Cherry Street Baptist Church. These lighthouses in various places that you have put us. God, I pray that we would be faithful. May we recognize you as the great creator God, the almighty God, the, the God who was able to rescue Daniel. And we, had, we put our trust in you that you're able to take care of us too. Please bless the services this weekend at all of the churches. God, help us to be faithful as teachers to communicate the truths of your word. Help us to be about your business, especially as we see the day approaching. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, Brother Ray. God bless you, Ben. Good to Have see you. Have a good Have weekend. Yeah.